imposter syndrome like the fear and the doubt is so high within us you've been doing this for a very long time do you feel that fear even today oh i think everybody does everybody has imposter syndrome i mean like i i don't think that that ever ever really goes away we want our work to be seen we want we want to be seen we want to communicate you know and but it's also you know how are we validated does is that does that validate us should we be more self validating i think don't be afraid to make stuff that you think no one's going to like and no one's going to buy like those those paintings to me have been the most rewarding that i've made and don't ever be afraid to make those if you just i think kind of like let your mind be open you just get all this kind of sensory input and i think that stuff that you connect with that's just kind of like coming in that's that's i try to stay in tune i don't want to sound too woo woo cuz i'm really a woo woo person but like but like being in tune with that stuff i think is really really helpful every morning the first thing so this has been me uh, for the past few months i wake up first thing in the morning and i go i mean how insane that sounds now but that's really that's what i do uh, i wake up in the morning it's um, and as soon as 8 o'clock strikes i know i need to post a reel on instagram and that's probably some work that you know catches my attention or like you know i enjoy and i'm like so i was scrolling through the feed and i saw one of this work and i shared and i shared like you know um i think it said like tom- uh, tomatoes in a box or a painting something and i loved it sorry pomegranates in a box or painting or something and i remember i put off my phone or somewhere and i came back a few a few hours later and it was blown i people were like i my mind is blown like they were crazy people were going crazy like you know uh, how has this like is this true i mean is this a painting it's a box i can't believe it and it was the 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 work i remember the work was called pomegranates and um, everybody was so in love with it and i was like you know what we need to get natalie on the podcast this needs to happen <laughs> so here you are here i am yeah pomegranates who knew <laughs> That has been a super fun series. I started that I don't know, maybe 8 years ago. Um Goodness. I actually moved. Yeah, I moved studios and like people are always like, "How did you come up with that idea?" And like I have all these still life props. I mean, moving moving studio for me is really a horrible experience. So I moved and I was in Palo and I had all these props in a box and I was like, "Oh, ooh, you know what? That might be really interesting." And I had had been working on cradle panels with the really deep sides. And so I started that series and it's been super fun. Like I love, you know, I love composing everything in the boxes, but I also love doing little stamps around the sides. Which Yes, when I've I started, seen your obsession about them. Yeah. I love that's my favorite part. I mean like I, I mean I have made paintings just so I could use some really silly stamp things on the sides. <laughs> um yeah, they they've been really fun. And and they they've been nice. I've done quite a few commissions with those. so getting to collaborate with other people and sort of like their vision and what what is meaningful for them um that's been a real treat i've i've gotten to do some really nice work with people i love that okay tell me something so i i i practiced this word for a couple of times before we started to call trampoline am i right oh that's perfect it's 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 so much better than my pronunciation yes that is perfect <laughs> I was like let me practice this before I actually go and say it on the mic. So, tr- trampoline for anybody who doesn't know is hyper realistic that give you a perception of um real versus like you know how the how your painting was. Can you define it better? I think I'm I'm not doing a good job. Yeah, no, the um trampoline like is a little different than hyper realism ch- classic trampoline. is is something okay. that usually has a very narrow depth plane so you see a lot of things like hung on a wall okay where it's very flat and it's supposed to look like you could almost touch them and peel them off sort of thing like things hanging from a ribbon that yes. that sort of thing um this a broader definition of trompe-l'oeil obviously just means full the eye in french um <laughs> where it looks like things that are two dimensional are actually or things that appear three dimensional are painted so it's a two dimensional surface 
Yes. Um, that is and look like, like three dimensional. Favorite. Yeah. So it it it's it is meant to sort of trick the viewer, and that is actually the reason I used to be a paint a lot more still life, and I got interested in Trump Loy because there is sort of this moment with the viewer where they have a shift in perception, like that. And for me, that that's the whole point. Like they <laughs> they're looking at it. They think it's they think it's real, and then all of a sudden they realize it's painted. And that sort of moment for me, where you're able to change someone's visual perception and their experience of the art, that's that is my money shot. That is what I'm all about. <laughs> that's I my love favorite that. part. Yeah, and like it's like it's like that one reaction when you get out of the audience, like the reaction that I saw in the comments. I was like, oh my god, it wasn't just me. Because sometimes what happens is like. you share a work and you know i resonate with it but not often like everybody would feel the same way about something we all have very different perceptions but um, i remember there are quite a few works that you share that really blows everybody's mind and i think yours was of course one of them and i want to ask you how did you land on this idea um like you know did you set like i i'm sure there would have been a lot of your own um evolution on how you've been doing this now um can you can we go back a little in time and see how your work evolved and you've landed here yeah that you, you know it's so funny when we were talking b- before you started recording we have a very similar story in that i had a whole another career before really? i started being a painter yeah i was a classical cellist yes i saw that yes 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 and you know what's even more interesting is i had to guess i had to ask this so when i was reading on your website it said you so you've written that you wanted a you know a more creative outlet than music for you and i'm really interested in learning what do you have to say about that i had started playing the cello when i was a very small child like 6 7 years old and like by the time i was 15 i had left home i'd gone to performing arts high school i never moved but i never lived at home again i was always touring or so that is a whole other podcast we don't even, we don't even need to get into that <laughs> but i had moved to new york and i was working in new york and you know just kind of had a moment where i was in my early 20s and i had been i was very burned out i had been doing this at a very high level for a very long time and you were very, very successful bored. I I was. I mean and and I think sometimes you know you can you can have success at something but not enjoy it and like yes, you kind absolutely. of get trapped, trapped there. Yes. Yeah, you I, when you were telling me about the whole fashion thing I'm like, "Oh, I get this." Yes. Um but I think, you know, it's like I just realized that I was probably going to spend the rest of my life sitting in an orchestra playing Mahler symphonies and it just terrified me. I'm like, "Oh my god, I don't even want to do that now," you know? And you know, I think a lot of people think, I mean, with classical music Yes it is creative but you're you know you're following the notes on a page they are telling you yes. what to do it's not like jazz or improv or something where which i consider to be very creative yeah so i drop i just dropped out i'm like i i got to i have to rethink my life like this is not going And how old were you by then? I was like 21 22 so you were yeah, pretty successful 20. in something Yeah and like everyone everyone my family my friends everyone thought like my life path was set. was set. Yes, you were that child who would like be like look at her. Yep. I I was that I was that kid and um <laughs> so I just dropped it. I'm like I'm done. I got to reevaluate this and I started taking classes at an art school in New York City just like nighttime, you know, for for adults. It was I've never been to an art school. I've just studied with different teachers in different places. I have no art degree. I'm not I have no like degree that says I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um I just started taking classes. I really loved it because for me that was a creative outlet. Like that to me was so much more creative than like following along in the orchestra and playing the notes on the page. But you know what? There's something that comes to my mind about this. I felt pretty much similar when it came to fashion and I feel very different about things today. So I studied fashion academically. Uh after I studied history actually. Both of them that I never thought I'll again have anything to do with are today playing one of the most like instrumental part of my own practice as an artist. And when I started my own business when I was also working in the fashion field I had just the same thing like I felt that this was a creative outlet for me. but it was only till the point where i was in you know in in a class uh 
learning something, having the permission to experiment, having like, you know, things like that. But the moment I went into the real world, it was about, um, it was about getting things done. It was about, um, you know, orders and deliveries and like stuff like that. And I felt like I, I wanted to do this because I wanted to be a creative and this doesn't feel like that for me. And I want to have a better creative outlet. And, you know, it, it was very hard for me and I was, uh, I, and I wasn't even remotely successful as you were. Um, but it was a major setback for me to realize like, you know, anything that I thought, like, you know, we all have these visions and ideas a lot of time that, okay, when I grow up or, you know, I want to be this. And specifically, so when I did fashion, I really fought with my family, like my father, because uh, for them, it never made sense. And I was like, now it's it's like a prestige issue also, because I took this big leap. And now I'm saying I don't want to do this after three, four years, I think four years. And it really shook my own trust on myself. And it took me a long time to b- build that back. Did you have any anything like that because you were doing pretty well and you know people would tell you okay you know you're doing so good or you know did you have any moments of self-doubt when you were regrouping yourself and thinking what you want to do further I am sure I did I mean it it has been a long time ago now like I I am (laughs) in my 50s so like we're talking like ancient history um I am certain that I did because like I do remember that being a really tough part of of this whole art thing you know, it's like trying to go to school and trying to learn and trying to work a full-time job and trying to put art, you know, and still try to find time to like be creative. Um, I was pretty single-minded. I'm very stubborn. So I, I don't remember anybody. I'm sure a lot of people tried to talk me out of it, but I was, <laughs> was pretty, pretty bent on it at that point. You know, I, I really was very loved what I was doing and very passionate about it. But I'm, I'm sure there were. I think my moments of self-doubt came a little later. Okay. Um, when was that? When I, um, I did, I studied in New York for 10 years with a bunch of different people, but the, yes. the bulk of my education, I spent six years with a painter named Michael Aviano. Yes. yes. Who really taught me everything I know. I'm incredibly grateful to him. I mean, it was a very six intense, years. hardcore. Yeah. I mean, six years, like it was, it, it was a long time, but I remember when I graduated from his program and it was very informal. Like we sat in his living room kind of thing. You only took a, a few students. It it's a, that would actually be another podcast. Um, yes, but anyway, I, we, I, we'll I finished, have several podcasts, that means. <laughs> <laughs> when I finished with Michael, and, and I see this today because I do talk to a lot of young artists. You know, yes. I, I love like talking and having art friends in our community is so important. But in speaking with them, like that was the hard part for me was getting out of school. Because now like you don't have that community every day and you're not working towards goals. All of a sudden you're just on your own and it's like, here you go, go be an artist. And like, that was hard. That to me was very difficult because you know, you're still working. You're trying to put together a portfolio. You're trying to start a career where maybe you're going to sell work or you're going to meet collectors or galleries. You know, you're, you're trying to get it going. You know, you have a skill set. you know, that you've just spent years learning and it's, it's hard. I mean, it is, that that to me, that's probably my, that was the most difficult part. I mean, you were already a musician. So I think the fear of being a creative, independent creative, I'm sure it wasn't, I mean, it wouldn't be so high. Was it like, did you, the idea of financial stability, how you would make a career out of this? Like, did you have any of those? Um, I, I was very fortunate in, in one aspect. I wasn't that worried because like you said, when I was a musician, like I'd gotten used to hustling. Like, I mean, yes. I got a lot of hustle. I had three orchestra contracts. I had a string quartet. I would show up and play weddings, bar mitzvahs, furniture openings. So you were, like, oh, whatever. Like you, were um, you were used to getting uncomfortable. I, yeah, and I was used to, like, hustling. Truly. So that didn't, that didn't, that, I was kind of okay with that. But, you know, I think with the art thing, it was hard to even get the hustle started. You know, it was yeah. like, but I ended up getting... You know, I was always had a job like waiting tables or, or you know, doing yeah. things like that always. And I was very lucky in that I got a job um, working as a decorative painter. And wow. the reason, yeah, you know, doing like faux finishes and stenciling and, you know, glazing walls and like uh, all that stuff. Um, but what was nice about that 
is it had some flexibility. Like I could take a job and work, okay. you know, I could go do like, you know, the lobby of some fancy New York city building for three weeks. And then I could take off a week or two and paint. Oh. So that for me became very important because it kind of enabled me to transition into having a portfolio, into being able to approach galleries, into like building a career that way. And I still had somewhat a stable income that I could kind of pick and choose when I would work. So like I always give that advice. I'm like, you know, if you have a nine to five job, that can be tough. That is yes. really tough, you know, yes. to try to ha- having something with a little more flexibility. If you can find a good fit for me, that was, that was, a, that was a big deal. Even when I was in the beginning of my career, uh, so I did a lot of design and branding. That's also one of my major skill sets. And I used to work with a company, which is um, of my friends and which is very, uh, is doing amazing now. And I, I always knew that I couldn't do a nine to five. And um, I really literally, I knew that I could make a lot more money if I would take a f- job like that. But that also mean giving up the choice of what I don't want to do with my own time. That was very important to me. And in the long run today, I think I was able to find my footing in both the places and actually work for both, like for better, because it on one end, it never put the pressure of, um, making money from my art instantly, taking a lot more risk, um, investing in myself. And honestly, I think um, when you work uh, in something different from what you're doing, there's so much of a learning curve and so many skills that you learn that you actually can apply in your own practice. I think that is, that's something I truly like. I feel like um, I wouldn't have been a more practical in the sense of an artist holistically who has knowledge about a lot of things other than just my own work if I would have had you know wouldn't have put myself out there like getting that discomfort like knowing learning about business even if I didn't had to and you know marketing and like um building a business or like you know all of those things that come very handy today oh my god that's such an amazing skill set you have I mean like I know so many people that don't have that and like to start with that as a foundation and then be able to build a creative practice around that. Like you are so like ahead of everybody else with that. Like, I mean, I've had so many conversations with people about branding and like, no, that's incredible, you know, to be able to build off that. You've had quite a few years of like, you know, of doing this. It's, you've been doing this for quite some time. What do you think was your biggest fear of, like, if you look back today, what do you think was something that held you back the most? I guess I think, I think something that I, and this is something I still try to balance in my own work. And I don't, I don't want to say held me back because what I'm fat, because this will sound really bad in that. (laughs) that Let's say you Um, struggled with or however you want to rephrase. I think I struggled with your answer. That's good. I like that. Um, I think something that I struggle with is probably because I make my living selling art. I mean, 95% of my income comes from gallery sales, right? Like that's, that is my path. Other people, you know, there's a lot of ways you can make money as an artist, yes. but that's, that's where I'm at, which is, I'm very lucky and very fortunate. Don't get me wrong, but I do have to find a balance between making work that is quote unquote commercial. Yes. You know, versus work that I feel very fulfilling. You know, it's, um, when I first started out, I did a lot more still life, which is very popular. And I was doing a whole series of like floral paintings, let's say. And people love them. The galleries love them. They're like, oh, you should make a bunch of these. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, but I would also like to do this sort of strange thing over here. And they're like, yeah, that's not going to sell as well. We we really just want the flower paintings. So that, I mean, that's an example. That, But I yes, think, yes. you know, commercially, that's something everybody struggles with. You want to make work that's fulfilling to you, work that is communicating and speaking to your viewers, that isn't just decorative you know, so it, but you also want to make, you know, you want to pay your rent out of like all these years you may have had, I'm sure you would. I I looked at your work, of course, um, different transitions, like, you know, like one, there's a phase, like, I think we all artists as artists have like these, these different phases, like sometimes like you are in this place of life where you're really interested in one particular subject and then you move from one and another. And those transitioning phases are, I think one of the hardest because there, that is one thing to tell the world what you are doing, but to not knowing yourself where you want to go, 
how how do you deal with that time being of you know where you've been selling via galleries for so many years how do you deal with those transitions i have sort of um i had a really a, a big one a few years ago where i was doing a lot of trompe crayon drawings and like the recession hit and all of a sudden nobody was selling anything so i got to actually really hit the reset button on that and really think about what i was going to do differently um but i think, and then what you did know, you do I just made a whole new body of work. I'm like, I'm done. Like I'll, I'll still make a few of those, but like, I've, I've got to like change. I, I've Shift got to things change up. course here. I mean, with me, I guess in, in one way, it's like, I'm always making work that's trompe l'oeil. Like, yes. so it's not like all of a sudden I'm making something that's radically different. I think, I think my themes change. Like yes. I, I paint a lot in series. Like I yes. have like comic things I like, and then there's like crayon things and there's box paintings and there's collages, you know, it's, I have seen yes. the back of the canvas paintings, which I freaking love. I would make, I would just make those. I, I want to do a, I want to do a solo show so badly where it's just the back. paintings turn the wall. Be hilarious. Yes. I think that would be a pretty great idea. No one wants to do this show with me though. Um, you but, should do the show. <laughs> they should, you right? Should do the show. But I think painting in series has been good for me that way. So it's not like, um, you know, and, but I do see some really amazing, like, you know, art realist artists that are doing one thing and then all of a sudden they're like you know 180 you know now they're doing something totally different so i, t- I tend to kind of keep doing my little thing it's recognizable as my work and trouble yeah. but i do yeah. switch up themes a lot like and i think that that kind of that helps me stay kind of fresh too so that i'm not making the same thing over and over and over again like if i made nothing but box paintings i'd probably go a little crazy i think i'd get a little yeah tired. yes absolutely okay tell me something honestly how long have you been making the trampoline paintings? Um, I I started, I was probably working full-time as an artist the late 90s. So, and I've, I probably switched over to Trump, pretty much trompe full-time somewhere in the early, maybe around 2005, 2006. So like- Goodness, 20 years, let's years say 20. Then. Because you know what, for me, like I loved still life and I would still paint still life. I, this is not me getting down on still life. I think still life is awesome, but it doesn't have the humor and the whimsy. Yes. And that's what yeah. I really love. Like for me, like the, the, yeah, that, that's it for me. You, when you're saying this, when I actually saw your work, I think actually it makes sense what you're saying. You do love a lot of still life. And I was looking at your process. Like when you make these paintings, you actually break the glass. And then like you said in the interview that you do, you're not making this up in your head. Like you're literally staging the setup so that you can actually spin it off. Yeah. And, and I don't work from photographs. Like, and I I think this is, this is, and I'm not anti-photo, like people that work (laughs) from photographs. This is awesome. Good for you. I just happen to be a really bad photographer. So, you know, I was trained to paint from life. So nice, that's just, yes. that's what I do. You know, I, I enjoy having it in the studio and being able to observe it, you know, firsthand yeah, instead of having yeah. it. You know, the, the, the photograph is observed firsthand, but there's there's almost a little barrier between you and this. You know, you've got a version of the subject. You're not sort yeah. of in the moment with it. Um, but that's just me. That's how I like it. So, you know, being able to set it up and work from life, I just... I love like building collages, building the little boxes. That's my favorite part. <laughs> I love painting them as hard. <laughs> as I speak to you and as I've seen your work and, you know, trying to put these pieces together, you know how I can imagine it right now? I feel like your trampoline paintings are like your spin off on still life with an addition of your personality because I've seen like you are this very humorous, like, um, very energetic, fun person, even though this interview may not be like, I think I'm pretty opposite to that because I, I love serious conversations and questions like that. But in general, you have this amazing, amazing energy, which is um, very energetic. And still life is a little slow. It's more serious. It's like going into, you know, and like when you, when I look at your work, if, you know, if there's no edges, when I look at it, it's like a still life painting for me, let's say as a viewer. Um, and I'm talking in a very literal sense because I think a lot of people like us who are within the arts understand, okay, this is a trampoline or this is like this. But when you're viewing art as art, people feel like, oh my God, this is so real. And the moment you shift on the edge, like you see the 
twist or you try to touch it and you try to see that oh this isn't like and that is i think your twist to your love adding a bit of who you are it is absolutely like you, because, because you know what like i mean the other thing too it's like a little kind of what we've been talking about like there are some amazing still life painters out there but like you know i painted a, a piece over the summer that had a shark with a laser beam strapped to its head and i mean that's hilarious like who's going to make that painting like somebody has to make that painting it should yes. be me you know like <laughs> we, don't, we don't need like another beautiful painting of moms for me no, we don't need to do that like yeah. you know not not when i can paint the shark with the laser beam so yeah i think that's part of it <laughs> okay next question tell me something did you do you ever feel like you are now let's say you you've been painting for 30 years basically okay i and you're this you you're this very confident person that i see like you know um you have a very positive energy and you know what you're doing right so i'm going to ask you this question <laughs> yeah <laughs> we got here <laughs> this is exactly what i want to talk about which is something a lot of artists i think most of us um struggle with i was recording in the morning with another beautiful artist um and we we were speaking about how so she said you know so she said even though she has a beautiful career she's very successful very popular she said she didn't have a proper job and we hold that moment i was like you know this is this is an interesting topic this is something i want to talk about like how we as artists like the imposter syndrome like the fear and the doubt is so high within us you've been doing this for a very long time okay do you feel that fear even today oh i think everybody does everybody has imposter syndrome i mean like i i don't think that that ever ever really goes away how has that fear evolved for you gosh oh that that's that's a hard one um <laughs> i think for me when i start feeling that way when when i do feel that way is usually when i'm making work that is not satisfying to me it's when i'm when my fear is that people are going to think i'm a hack which may be a little nuanced over imposter syndrome <laughs> you know but i mean it's it's nomenclature it's word choice a hack that's probably my fear um you know that that i'm making schlocky work you know i'm making cheap work i'm making just work that's commercial that i'm just churning it out for a buck like that is my fear um and usually when when that happens i just i kind of re readjust where what i'm going to work on you know it's like that that to me pushes me towards like you know the paintings that maybe are a little more difficult or are going to be a little stranger or a little more out there you know that for me that that's my anecdote to that okay tell me something you've said something interesting and this is the second time like so mass fashion is let's say a lot more commercial fashion then let's say designer segment or a lux luxury or a couture but you'd never see um let's say a mass fashion designer say that okay they're doing it for commercial or they're making money out of it and but when we as artists a i think when we are successful and we're selling fast a lot of us have this idea of being a sell out or you know we're being a commercial artist this fear is in within all of us no matter what kind of work we're doing and i think i'm i'm just interested in just talking about this because like looking at you you have like an incredible incredible like you've done some amazing things you've shown your work you've have had these awards and like in spite of like i if i were to read your bio and like your accolades it'll take me quite a few minutes isn't it let's be honest i've been doing it a long time as you said yes. i am old it's really it's just a, a testimony <laughs> to how old i am but yeah no i don't i wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't comply by that i think you we all as artists i think we struggle with the idea um i think these notions and i think that's why i started this podcast and i'm like you know no i i truly believe I truly when I I'm looking at your work and you know your energy and I'm sure the work that you do I'm sure oh my god the amount of hours and the amount of work and the technical skill it takes to go that far is like we know how hard it is I think anyone who's anywhere remotely associated with being a creative we all understand how challenging it is and 
in spite of all of that when we're doing well we're so afraid because being being an artist comes with this baggage that we have to think about like am i do you like what are your thoughts on that oh i i think it's um i mean i i don't feel badly about being able to pay my mortgage like that is not like badly i don't feel bad <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I've not had to go get a job like mixing paint at like Home Depot, like mixing house paint, yet, which is my fallback. I'm like, you know, if this doesn't work out, that's what I'm going to do. I mean, because I have no skills. I can't even fold sweaters at the Gap. Like, no, I, mean, I, I got to go mix paint at the hardware store. I think you would be a very good uh, comedian. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. have you ever tried stand stand-ups? Oh my god, no! Oh my god, no! <laughs> well, I, oh, I don't know. I don't. Know. But yeah, I don't I don't know. You know, it's like I I've been thinking a lot about lately external validation. Yes. Like, like I think that so many are like we want our work to be seen. We want we want to be seen. We want seen, to communicate. Absolutely. You know, and but it's also, you know, how are we validated? Does is that does that validate us? Should we be more self-validating? You know, like should we just feel good about what we've made? Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, yeah. I don't have a, that is not that's more of a just a topic for discussion than like something I have an answer to. I don't have yeah. an answer. Right, so, absolutely. We're not looking for an answer. Yeah, I I've been thinking a lot about that because like I do think I, I probably I get maybe I'm I'm relying too much on external validation. You you yeah. know what I mean to kind of like Yeah, we're all are. Yeah, like that that's something I kind of I need feel like I need more balance there. Yeah, and I think we all I think uh being an artist is also um it's i think the validity it's not even just the validation i think we've made it or people around us have made it so like you if you have to be an artist you have to be this like pious like this you know this this persona that okay a good or a creative person isn't like you do not have to be too commercial and honestly i feel this is one of the things that holds a lot of artists specifically in the beginning of their career back i think it held me back for a very long time because i felt like so people because i didn't come from an art school and i was a designer i still remember so this is like a huge frame up um from where i am and very successful you know frame some of the most um outstanding works made in india and you know all of that and i was this new artist um coming out of fashion design making like these amazing details like i really love my work even when i look that back i really did good work and i so i went to that uh, framer and i told them uh you know i want to get this framed and so at that point i was so obsessed with colors my work was very very colorful it's not as colorful today um and i was very obsessed with those colors and I told him that I wanted to have um, a green lamination with it like and he was like you know what um that seems like a lot more crafty and I'm sure you do, do you do not want to uh you know do like that um you know a white wall a white padding like you know frame is what you know is a a quality perception of art and instantly i felt discarded i felt and i was still um i was still very conscious of my own identity of not coming from an art school being like you know a designer and like still all of those things and i held myself back and i was so ashamed like you know that i'm this commercial artist like this crafty person who's just trying to be like this artist and today i'm exactly where even further i mean in the way of how i would want to frame my work in the way i would want to you know all of even further and this is something i think how how we are capture like we are suppressing our own creativity do do you have what is the worst advice you've heard so far like something like this that really like do you, have you ever had an experience like that um oh like somebody mansplaining how to frame my yes. work yeah sure no absolutely no. <laughs> really i mean is that oh, sure. Is that so um, common? Well, you know, I mean, I I definitely had that experience with a framer in New York City who like I went in and I had these very colorful little still life paintings that I I needed a frame for right away. He was the only guy that would make a frame right away. Like I okay. could have it in a week. 
And he was really rude. And I was like, oh, I want these sort of crazy frames over here. And he's like, no, you just want gold. And like, you don't know what you're doing. And like, and at this point I was like, I got really intimidated. And the thing was the paintings were on stretcher, stretcher bars. They were canvas, stretch canvas. And then he took it and he put the thing together and he took a nail and he started hammering into the back of the thing. And I was so freaked out. And this guy had been so rude to me. I, I, I just, I was like, stop, just stop. Like I, let go of that painting. I'm leaving. <laughs> like I, I'm out the door. But it just, uh, yeah, I've had I've had weird things like that happen. What was the worst experience? Can you recall one? Let's look at it. The most insane advice. Oh my God! I don't. I'd have to think about that for a second. I mean, because I've had a lot of really bad advice. Oh my goodness. Um, oh jeez. Oh, I don't. You know, I'm. I, because there's like career advice, there was teaching advice, there's any like, kind of anything that you want to share. I was uh, studying at the Art Students League in New York City, which is like a, a big art school. And, and it's sort of anyone can go and study there. They had some very famous teachers. And this was when I was first learning to draw and paint. And like, I knew nothing. I mean, you, I, I was like ground zero. I didn't, I did not come from an artistic background. I had never drawn and painted anything. My parents were not like zero. So I'm in the school. I'm taking a life drawing class and I, I know I want to paint realistically. Like I do okay. know that much. I've figured that out. Like I want it to look like the thing. And I'm studying with this very famous anatomy teacher. And so the class is life drawing. We're drawing from a model and there are anatomy lessons, but it's very frustrating because it's this huge class and there's light everywhere. You know, the model's moving around. Like it's very we didn't have yes. a one directional light source. We didn't have like a, a, a the model was not really, it, it was a, it was a hot mess. And I remember going up to him after class and I was like, this is kind of a hot mess. Like I am struggling. Yeah. The model's all over the place. The lighting is all over the place. I'm trying to learn. Find a way. And he's like, dear, you know, go home, take an egg, put it on the table, put your light on it that you want and shade it. And then you'll know how to, you know, draw the human form. And I thought, this guy's an idiot. Like, like, this is the guy teaching the anatomy class? Like, I don't think so. I don't think that's how it works. Like, if it was that simple, like, yeah. Mm. So I remember that one. That one kind of blew my mind. Um, I've got, I'm sure I've gotten tons of advice, but like now that I'm on the spot, I'm having a hard time thinking of really horrible ones. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> Whenever you do, rem do remember, let us know. Send me a voice note. <laughs> But that's also a good thing. I think uh, that also shows like how, um, like how you let go of things. I try. Oh, I don't let go of much. Yeah. Oh, I, really? I kind of wear that stuff like a birthmark. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't know. A, a lot of replaying like what I should have done later. I'm like, oh, I wish I'd said that. Oh, I wish I'd said that. Yeah. A lot of that. Well, you, but you know, it's like you, I'm alone all day long painting. So I have a lot yes. of time of to course. like ruminate. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I get that. I get that. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about your work because, because a lot of people would want to hear that. And I've, we've taken quite a few, uh, actually quite a few long time to reach here, but okay. Tell me something. I'm very interested in knowing a, how long does it take for you to make these paintings? Um, what your process looks like. I know that you set up these, but like, I saw that, yes, you also have like, what is, what is with the words you, apart from those pomegranate paintings, I saw there was like, you know, the puzzle pieces together and you had those pearls. And for that moment, I'm, I was like, you know what? Oh, wow. I'm very excited when I see someone else using pearls and, you know, embroideries. And then I realized, oh my God, it's not the pearl. It's actually a painting. So, and the collage ones, my absolute favorite, um, the masked one, the spider uh, what was that? Um, you spoke about it in one of your interviews, and I saw that. Oh God, what was it? Uh, the one with the hand-drawn um, look and feel, like the crushed paper with crayon look. And I was like, Oh, I've done. The, I've done a lot of the crayon ones. Um, yes. Is it a collage painting? I'm trying to think which. which a lot of them have masks. <laughs> no, it was. Spider, it, it had like a quote. Oh, the written spider on. from Mars? Yes, yes, yeah, spider from, yes, spider from Mars. Yes, yes, yes. I, I think, you know, it, it kind of depends on the, the paint, like kind of which series it is. Um, 
some pieces like the crayon ones i actually do pretty quickly only because i've made so many of them <laughs> um you know with with some how like that, what I'm, is quick for you quick for me quick for me would be a week quick for me would be about a week most of my paintings take around two to three weeks to it kind of depends um but you know also when i say week i should be clear i paint a lot i'm like one of those like very obsessive people that i have no problem painting for 10 hours a day and, and wow. if i have a tight deadline which unfortunately i usually do have a tight, tight deadline which yeah. i do like like i set yeah. those up they're very motivating for me i thrive on pressure it's not for everybody <laughs> I totally um but yeah if i have to paint 12 hours i'll do that you know i yeah, i no i always have a target right like i know when things have to be dried to be varnished to be framed to be shipped you know i've, I've got i'm playing a long game like a long game yeah. so um so when i say something takes a week we're talking 70 hours we're not talking like 40 hours yeah yeah <laughs> um but yeah no i love i like to build everything and set it up whether that is like a crayon drawing i actually draw it all in crayon i crumple it up i tape it to the wall like everything wow. is sitting in the studio um so that is always my process. I do tend to make very simple. Then you simple. also break the glass? Oh yeah. Oh, I I have like this is I'm looking at it right now. I have probably 20 different glass panes that I've broken and then sort of taped and then I carefully store them. So like depending on the size of the frame that it's sitting, like I have all these different little broken glass models that I can just switch in and out of frames. I know it's so <laughs> But it's, you know, I just, I kind of, I like how it's set up, but, um, yeah, yeah I have a oh, lot wow. of, just way too much junk in my studio, but, um, but you know, I have Never everything done. set up. I tend to make a, a very simple line drawing. I, I mean, it's accurate, but I don't get crazy with like shading. I don't need it. I just need a really simple line drawing. I use an oil transfer, um, which I'm actually going to put a reel on Instagram today about oil transfers. Cause I'm doing that later. Um, yes, I, I can't wait to see. But, yeah. It's fun. I mean, I like oil transfer. And if you watch the reel, you will find out why. Because I will. Awesome. But, I will. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways to transfer onto panel. But I do paint on panel. Um, yes. I figure out the drawing. Actually, the world thing you keep paint on cartons. Yeah, I, it is not painted on a carton. A lot of people think it's cardboard. I know. I actually yes. had somebody ask me if I glued the cardboard to the sides. And I'm like, I also thought that. No. Like, me no, too. I didn't. <laughs> when I first saw that, I felt like, You'd put, I had like an idea because, you know, with Instagram, now, you know, like there will be a twist that would come. And I was like, I think I was expecting that this would like, it, they seem so real, but I had this like intuitively, like, you know, uh, this wouldn't be like, this would be a painting, but it came to me as a surprise when the edges came out. And I was like, maybe the painting is in like in a carton. And then it was like, it took me quite a few videos to figure out that actually that was a panel. <laughs> I've, I've started doing ones now where I hold them and, and do, you know, turn them. So I'm like, it's, it's a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, but like, I just make a simple drawing and transfer it and then paint. Like, I don't, my process is really simple. I don't, there's not really much going on besides that. Um, what was I going to say? I do, um, one thing that I've noticed, I think is kind of funny. I tend to build these things not knowing what size they're going to be. Like I have a new collage that I'm starting today and like, I just glue everything down. I get very inspired. I do not worry about how am I going to paint this thing? I'm like, ah, I will figure that out later. Like later. I'm going to just put everything that I want in there and I'm not going to think about how big it is or how I'm going to paint it. I'm just going to make the thing that I love and then deal with it. So, you know, okay. last night I was working on my drawing for this new one. I'm like, holy crap, this thing's huge. It's huge. It's like 22 by 18, which for me is like giant and yeah. I'm sure... Anybody listening to this podcast is now laughing hysterically because that is not <laughs> giant by anybody's standards except mine. But, you know, but I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is going to be big. This is going to be really big. Mm. So, you know, but I do size, I make everything fit my composition. Like I don't, I don't start and go, well, I need something that fits an eight by 10 panel, everything. And then I cut all my own panels. It's all custom made. So like, sometimes I end up with these really weird panels. My framer's like, you know, it's 16 and three quarters by 22 and an eight. And I'm like, yeah, and you're a custom framer. So this shouldn't be an issue. You should be able to make that frame. No problem. Um, so I do work backwards a little yeah. bit that way, but like everything fits the composition, not the other way. Yeah. And often we think, think like the flow is linear versus a lot of times it's so much of back and forth and twisting and shaping and like, you know, 
and oh questioning yourself. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the. Can you see this in the background? I can see like a transfer.、Here? I can see a transfer. It's um. There's a board back behind there. Anyway, I have the big inspiration board in my studio, and I'm、oh, like、wow. super old school, where it's like there are little、Cut. scraps of paper or things I found on the ground, and like so it's like that's that's where I keep everything, and I like to have it out. Like I know a lot of people keep computer files, but like I need like the scrap、Printing. of paper. Yes. So I mean, I have stuff that's been up there for years. Years and you know, eventually I kind of get to it. Sometimes it's song lyrics or a piece of poetry or like a leaf. I mean, like I have like these this little man I made out of branches three years ago to do like a forest scene, and he's just hanging out. He's waiting.、Um, so I tend to just catalog everything up there when I'm organizing like a solo show.、Um, I have a big show coming up in the fall in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and so. You know, already I'm starting to make lists of what that show is going to be, and coming up with a title, and coming up with like what I'm going to make. So, so I'm kind of ready to go once that's all kind of worked out. But yeah, I love that. Like that, if my house burned down, I'd probably grab that. <laughs> that would be like one of the things I would be running up the front, which is why I should probably have it digitized. Like, that would But yeah, no, you can take a photo of that just in case that happens. I, I had a teacher tell me, and I don't think this is accurate exactly, but a teacher early on who told, and he was old, he was probably my age now. He's like, you know, as you get older, I'm like, oh, that poor guy, he's ancient, like fifty. He's like, as you get older, you're going to run out of ideas, so make sure you write them down. Which I don't think I run out of ideas, but writing them down, really good idea. You know, like you have this wellspring. I think something that I feel like I would, so I would really like if something comes to my mind. I would write it somewhere. I do not have like one place always. Like it's my notes app, it's it's my journal, and then it's my daily planner and stuff like that. And and I love collecting. Like I love collecting books, but I also love filling and then looking back at those pages and just just looking at what I was thinking at that point. And so many times that has happened to me when I you know. When I look back at an old notebook and I see the back papers and I have these like checklists, like I have to do this, and I I remember this just happening like a couple of months back. I remember when I started Arts to Hearts and I had these like you know I would host, you know exhibits and you know make books and like you know we'll have something like this and I had these like tickers and everything was pending by then. And when I looked, I had checked off all of that, and I feel like the moment I start writing. No matter how that timeline is, but it just it I do feel that it does make a lot of difference in the reality that you're creating. Absolutely. I mean, I just I for me that's yeah. And because you know the other thing, it's like I used to think I was going to remember, like oh I'll remember. Yes. No, I don't remember.、No. Like I I mean I forget things by lunchtime, and it might have been a great <laughs> idea. So yeah, I, that to me that's that is invaluable. Not everything、yes. on there is going to be a painting, but like. Things change, things move, yes. Things, things mutate, so yeah, it's, that's a big、okay. thing for me. Okay, last before we go into the rapid fire. Okay, how do you find new ideas? You've been painting、Ooh. for a very long time. Okay, you've been doing this again for a long time. So I'm asking you questions that are like, you know, thirty years. You're painting and you're making these paintings for such a long time. I'm sure、yeah. at some point you're like,、hmm, what do I do now? Do you come with that moment, or how do you keep inspired? I think just being open to ideas, like just you know what I mean. Like, I, like I mean, this is ridiculous to say, but like I'm really visual. You know, it's like just seeing things and being just kind of staying open to it. I don't know because like I'll see something that just kind of like, like I was reading a poem like years ago called, the, and and somewhere in it was the line, "The transparent heart." And I was—I mean, this is just an example because that's what I'm working on. And I thought I have no idea what that means, but I love that idea, and so I wrote <laughs> it down. You know, and it's like—and now it's a painting. So it's like I think just continually being open to things. Yeah. You know, just kind of letting letting ideas kind of come to you, and like just being open. You know, because I think it's easy to kind of like shut that down a little bit and just being like,、yeah. "Well, I'm going to make this thing. I'm I'm doing this thing." You know. Yeah. Because like sometimes I get the craziest ideas. Like if I'm out for a walk, or like, you know, just if you just I think kind of like let your mind be open. You just get all this kind of sensory input, and I think that stuff that you connect with that's just kind of like coming in. That's that's 
I try to stay in tune. I don't want to sound too woo woo because I'm not really a woo no. person, but like, <laughs> but like being in tune with that stuff, I think is really, really helpful. Love that. I am so, so excited that we were able to do this. I know. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's like we've spoken for almost an hour, like it's 50 minutes and it's just flown by. And I say this for every podcast episode. I'm like, how quick time goes when you're speaking to people and you're really enjoying. So thank you so much. Oh, I am you. I'm very grateful for your honesty. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I'm <laughs> I'm yeah, I will sometimes I don't have a good answer, but yeah, I I I yeah. Oh you had great answers. <laughs> Okay, but let's have a little bit fun. Okay, I have a quick rapid fire for you. Give me this or that. Okay, choose. Creativity or perfectionism. Which is more important to you in your work? Perfectionism. <laughs> that, so you, okay, so you're one first person, first, honestly, you're the first person and I really wanted to ask you this because you can't live without, without both of these because your work is like perfect to the T. It has to look like the thing. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like, like it could yes. be very creative, but if it's sloppily painted, I have missed the boat. Like, for it yes. to really work as a top boy, it could be a sort of lousy idea, but boy, it better be painted well. So <laughs> I don't like to have to pick. That's hard. That's like Sophie's choice there. I shouldn't pick. But um, you said I had to, and it was rapid. <laughs> your work, it truly, truly signifies your work. Like, it's literally perfect like even the crease of the cardboard on the side it's like it's even when you know it's tricking your mind I feel like I still feel like it's a cardboard <laughs> what do I do about it that makes me very happy like it really <laughs> insanely happy <laughs> okay next questions early morning or late night what is your creative zone early early morning I go to really? bed early. I'm old. Yeah. I'm in bed by like <laughs> nine o'clock. I'm done. I'm just, I'm done. Yeah. I get up early now. I didn't <laughs> used to though. That has changed. When I was yeah. younger, I would stay up until four or five o'clock in the morning. So yeah. Yeah. That's, that's changed. That's changed. <laughs> music or silent? Music. So what kind of Absolutely. music do you hear? Um, I would listen to just about anything. I used to listen to like news and I can't do that anymore because it makes, it makes my skin hurt. Um, so now only music and I discovered lo-fi like a couple oh. years ago. I love lo-fi. Like I had never heard of that. I found it on Spotify. I'm like, what is this? It's yes. incredible. <laughs> um, yeah. So like anything like that, any kind of electronica, indie, um, I love Daft Punk. I've listened to Daft Punk pretty much nonstop since May. I don't know why. I don't know how that happened. Um, yeah, I just, I like, and I will listen to the same thing over and over and over, over and over, over again. And over again. To, to the point I that I don't even hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, this is something that I also do. So I, I'm like, I have very few songs or things. And and I really love that moment. And I know when the day this is happening, I've had a fantastic day. Because anything that's happening in the background, I know it's happening. But I also don't know what's happening. Like, I have no clue what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Next question. What is the best piece of advice you've heard from another artist? It's one I've heard from other people, but it's also one that I give out all the time. And that is to find art friends, like finding your little tribe and your community. And that with the one good thing that came out of the pandemic is Zoom. Like I have yeah. joined Zoom groups. I have met all these amazing artists, like through Instagram, like all these, pla all these places that I've made really good friends. And sometimes they're only through a screen. Sometimes we actually get to meet up in life. But like being an artist is hard. And yes. having people that understand what you do and what you struggle with. They're, my own friends and family do not get things on yes. the same level that, that people I know over the internet understand. So Yes, I, I relate to this 100%. So important. I mean, they can help you with your career. They can help you like you know, the nuts and bolts of gallery business. Like everything. This yeah. is so valuable. Like that... Make some art friends. Yes. Okay. What is the most important lesson you've learned in your own creative career? One lesson that you would like to share? I think don't be afraid to make stuff that you think no one's going to like and no one's going to buy. Like those, those paintings to me have been the most rewarding that I've made. And don't ever be afraid to make those. Because there are sometimes I make stuff and I'm like, no one is going to like this. I'm going to spend a month on it. No one's going to buy it. I'm going to have that, like, it's, 
I'm wasting my time here. But you know what? You have to make those pieces. Yes. Once in a while, you really have to make those you pieces have to. and, and yes. stand by that. Lovely. Okay. Has technology helped you or hindered your creative process? I would say it's helped a lot. Um, I mean, like Instagram has been huge. Like I love Instagram because like I don't sell anything. I don't, I'm not, I don't sell. Like what I like about Instagram is meeting people and like seeing yeah. art. Like for me, that's, yeah. that's what I love. So that's blowing everybody's mind. Right. Like I'm getting to talk with you today. How would, yes. how would that have happened without, Happy. that would not have happened. You know, so no. like, how cool is that? You know, so I love seeing art. I love connecting with people, talking with people. Um, I am not a tech, like, obviously I could not download the browser to talk to you today. So I'm not a <laughs> but you did like, it. I did it. I did it. But you you're probably did. like, this person is a Luddite. But anyway, <laughs> um, like I, this, just this year, I took this really amazing Photoshop class and learned some Photoshop skills that I've been able wow. to use now. That's been, and they're, they're just kind of Photoshop for artists, but it's like, that's new. I'm like, okay, technology, yes, here we it. go. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm down with it. Like if it helps me, if it makes things easier, if it facilitates getting a painting done faster, I'm all for it. Yes, yes. Love that. Last question. What do you think is the most important thing for anyone who is, is aspiring to be um, lead a creative career, specifically with it? What is your advice for them to focus on today? If they're listening to this episode, anyone who's listening to this episode. Have art friends. Art friends, definitely. I'm, I'm always, always going to go back to have art friends. Um, I think knowing that you're probably going to have to make some sacrifices and yeah. deciding on what you're, what you're going to be comfortable with. That's different things for different people. Yeah. I think being true to your vision within practicality. You know, you, you may also have to make some concessions there. You know, it's like if you want to pay your rent, you may have to make those still life paintings. There's a balance. I, I think probably finding balance would be like oh, if I had to have a big, point. broad answer. Yeah, would be balance because it can't. I'm a very practical girl and do like paying my rent. So, you know, I think it's both. I think you can have both. I think you just have to decide where your line's going to be. Like this is acceptable. This is not. This Here's is not the path acceptable. I'm going to walk. So I yes. think being aware of that consciously, thinking about it, making a plan, you know, like making a plan for that. I think that would be my plan. What a wonderful advice. Yes, balance. I love that. I've, I've been speaking about this um, for quite some, like in the recent uh, videos, like balance, how, like, how, like as an artist, we're impulsive people and how balance is so much important for us also. Thank you so much, Natalia. I'm so, so happy. Before I let you go, what are you working on next? I know you have a lot of things happening. Uh, where can people find you, support you? Anything that you want to share for people who are listening to you right now? This is your moment. Yeah, no, I'm on Instagram. Like, come and say hi. Like, I love chatting and like connecting with people on Instagram. That is like, I tend to post, I try to post every day. So like, New things I'm working on are always up there, but I really love the connection with other artists. So like, leave me a comment. I will always comment back. Always, always, always. Um, yeah, I've got two big shows coming up in October. I have a solo show at Meyer Gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and a group show at Gallery 1261 that I'm very excited about because that's going to be a bunch of big, big name artists. Oh, um, I'm teaching a couple of workshops. Hey, teaching which and, ones? Um, um, I'm definitely doing a Scottsdale workshop in the fall oh, and I may be teaching in Boston and Los Angeles this summer. I'm still Amazing. trying to nail that down. But, still, but that obviously anything that I'm doing would be on Instagram or my website. So anyone who's listening to this episode, I will make sure that we take all the information from Natalie. And whenever your workshops are also live, make sure you let us know so that we can sp spread the word for you. But for now... All the links, all the crazy paintings and her process and her images and the videos, her Instagram and the website, all of this with the Q&A, a small concise format of this episode for you to just go through and then the link to listen to this podcast, everything on the website. We want to make this easier for you. We do not only want you to, you know, listen or watch this episode, but also like 
see the craziness that goes behind. So I'm going to ask Natalie to share us like, you know, some crazy picture or something that, you know, that will uh, add a little more edge to our uh, resource about you. And make sure you check that out. And if you like this episode, I think it has some incredible advices. And I think specifically when it comes to, you know, we all keep asking, I think, there's a certain kind of difference of perspective in someone who's been doing something for the past 30 years. And I think I really, truly value that because um, I think it's just so relieving when someone who's been doing this for 30 years and they say, like you said, like, oh, I there's so many times I feel afraid. And I'm like, okay, so where, where I am, I'm okay. Like, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. If, if you can do this being afraid, I can still manage. So... I think this is an incredible resource. This could help so many other young artists and people who have creative aspirations. So make sure you like and let me, if you like this episode, me and Natalie know that you did. Make sure you support Natalie's work. Leave a comment like she said, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you so much.